Hey! Oh! Oh! What? What? Kunk's corner. We're we we back in this. <laughs> Yay! We we back in this right now. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome. I don't think the chat's working. So, uh, <laughs> for me at least, I can't see any. Oh no, it's popped back. Oh yeah, there's a delay. Okay, everybody, welcome back. This is Conk's Corner. My name is John Voth. This is Mark over here. He's my roommate. Uh, up, up top over here, you can see Dexter with all his friends. Uh, we are reading uh, Harry Potter every single day for an hour, at least. And I haven't read the books before. I have only seen two of the movies. When I was a kid, don't remember anything from them. So this is all a surprise. No spoilers, please, in the comments. Um, I, I, I do, I, I get to read the comments afterwards this time, I, so this is great. I get to read everything you write in there. Uh, I leave a little time at the end for some Q and A's. Uh, welcome back everybody. Today was a, today was a, a fun day. Today was a fun day. Um, so yesterday when I was walking Dexter, there was this crow on the side of the road who, um, uh, he, he wasn't really moving much, so I just thought, okay, it's just, just a normal crow, whatever. And then today I walked by, sitting in the exact same spot, and it came close, and, uh, it's, its wings weren't working, it couldn't fly, and it had a broken leg or something like that. So I caught it, put it in a box, followed all the guidelines online, called a place, and we named it Gary. And me and Mark dropped it off at this wildlife rescue place. Yeah. So, uh, basically a crow savior. Basically uh, a crow hero. Basically a crow hero. Uh, my name is Crow Daddy, or also Papi Cuervo. <laughs> you can call me pa Papi Cuervo. <laughs> uh, okay, um, okay, so what are we doing here? We're, 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 we, we can just jump, jump right into it. Let me actually, there are a couple of other things to mention. Um, oh, yeah, so I changed things around so you can easily find my uh, you the, the live on my YouTube. It's now on the main ch channel right away, so you don't have to search around. Some people are finding difficulties, but I didn't know you could, you know, feature it and all that stuff, so that's what I did. Um, what are the, what else? What else? What else? Um, oh yeah, and you can. Put, there's a little bell on the side when you subscribe. It, it sends you a notification. That go so if you hit that bell, it'll send you a link and tell you where to go back to the live easily. Like, comment, and subscribe. Yeah, I'm not doing that. I'm, all I'm saying is if you want a notification, because if people are asking me, how do I find it? So if you have difficulties with that. Um, oh yeah, so tomorrow is, you know that gig I had for for a while there? Tomorrow is my last day of that gig, so tomorrow I won't be able to read, but I'll go extra long today for that. So I'll be back on Thursday. Today I'm going extra, extra long, Thursday I will be back. So I don't know how we'll be going extra long today for, for, for a while there. Okay, let's just, uh, let's just get into it, shall we? I'm, uh, I'm happy we're, we're back into this. I'm, uh, I'm happy we're, we're doing this regularly again. Definitely not gonna do that, John. Well, don't then. Not not Jose Cuervo. Oh, yeah, it's it's Papi Cuervo. Okay, I'm gonna. It, this is so confusing because it's so different from the other. Uh, which side was it? Well, you're seeing it on this side. You're seeing it on this side, right? So I have to draw on the other side now. Uh, uh, I can't even think straight. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, this is also running out. Come on now. I, I, can't, <laughs> I don't know where to put this. Oh no! Okay, new marker is for next time. I'm gonna find a new marker. Let's do this. Okay, what? Where do we leave off? Oh yeah, Harry lost it on Ron and Hermione uh, because you know all his reasons are very understandable. All very understandable reasons that he's that he's brought up. Now um, he's he's pissed at them, and um, who who was pop? Who was just F F Floyd and Greg, the two brothers, Floyd and Greg, right? Fred and George. <laughs> You're not happy with that? No. Oh, the, your cam isn't working. Oh well, I'll have to test it for next time. Oh, I don't know. The fuck? What, what do you mean? Sorry, language. <laughs> okay. I have no filter. Uh, okay, what's well, not working today? We'll just get. We'll just start reading. Uh, where did they? They? They f both fell. Oh, okay, there. We are. With two loud cracks. Here we go. Let's. Start. With two loud cracks, Fred and George, Ron's elder twin brothers, had materialized out of thin air in the middle of the room. Pigwidgeon twittered more wildly than ever, and zoomed off to join Hedwig on top of the wardrobe. Stop doing that, Hermione said weakly to the twins. Oh, weakly. 
who are all as vividly red-haired -hair as Ron, though stockier and slightly shorter. Hello, Harry, said George, beaming at him. We thought we heard, you, heard your dulcet tones. <laughs> you, you don't want to bot, uh, bottle up your anger like that, Harry. Let it all out, said Fred, also beaming. There might be a couple of people filthy 50 miles away who didn't hear you. <laughs> That's annoying. You two passed your apparition tests then, asked, asked Harry grumpily. With distinction, said Fred, was holding what looked like a piece of very long flesh-colored string. It would have taken you about 30 seconds longer to walk down the stairs, said Ron. Time is galleons, little brother, said Fred. Anyway, Harry, you're interfering with reception, extendable ears. He added in response to Harry's raised eyebrows, and held up the string, which Harry now saw was trailing out onto the landing. We're trying to hear what's going on downstairs. You want to be careful, said Ron, staring at the ear. If Mum sees one of them again, it's worth the risk. That's a major meeting they're having, said Fred. The door opened and a long mane of red hair appinned, uh, appeared. <laughs> Who is this? Ginny! Okay, Ginny. Oh, hello, Harry. Said Ron, no. Oh, hello, Harry, said Ron, Ron's younger sister, Ginny Brightly. I thought I heard your voice. Turning to Fred and George, she said, It's no go with the extendable ears. She's gone and put an imperturba, in, imperturbable charm on the kitchen door. How do you know? said George, looking crestfallen. Fallen. Tonks told me how to find it, said Ginny. You just chuck stuff at the door, and if it can't make contact, the door's been impertubed. I've been flicking dung bongs at it from the top of the stairs, and they just saw away from it, so there's no way the extendable ears will be able to get under the gap. What are they talking about? Okay, dung... Okay, what? <laughs> what is going on? Uh, um, Impertubable. In, imperpu, imperturbable. <laughs> this is um, not being able to listen in, I guess. Yeah, or get kind of close to it, I think. There's like some kind of force to it. Okay, okay, and so... Flicking dung bongs at this, at what? At the door. At the door, for the top stairs, and they just saw. Okay, oh, she was testing it. I thought she was like, okay, gotcha. Fred heaved a deep sigh. Oh, shame. I really fancied finding out what old Snape's been up to. Snape said Harry quickly. Is he here? Yeah, said George, carefully closing the door and sitting down on one of the beds. Fred and Ginny followed, giving a report, top secret. Git. Git. Not jit. Git. Git, said Fred idly. He's on our side now, said Hermione reprovingly. Ron snorted. <laughs> doesn't stop him being a git, the way he looks at us when he sees us. Bill doesn't like him either, said Ginny, as though that settled the matter. Harry was not sure his anger had abated yet. I love that word for some reason. Abated. But his thirst for information was now overcoming his urge to keep shouting. He sank onto the bed opposite the others. Is Bill here? He asked. I thought he was working in Egypt. He applied for a desk job so he could come home work and work for the order, said Fred. He says he misses the tombs, but he smirked. There are compensations. What do you mean? Remember, remember old Fleur de la Coeur, said George. She's got a job at Gringotts to improve her English. <laughs> I love these two. <laughs> um, and Bill's been giving her a lot of private lessons, sniggered Fred. <laughs> Charlie's in the order too, said George. But he's still in Romania. Dumbledore wants as many foreign wizards brought in as possible. So Charlie's trying to make contacts on his days off. Couldn't Percy do that? Harry asked. The last time he had heard, the third Weasley brother was working in the Department of International Magic Cooperation at the Ministry of Magic. At Harry's words, all the Weasleys and Hermione exchanged darkly significant looks. Huh? Huh? Uh-oh. Uh okay, let me change the page. Do not protrude, per protrude with a secret meeting. Whatever you do, don't mention Percy in front of Mum and Dad, Ron told Harry in a tense voice. Why not? Because every time Percy's name's mentioned, Dad breaks whatever he's holding and Mum starts crying. 
<laughs> <Hey. laughs> <You> just... <laughs> Fred said. It's been awful, said Ginny sadly. Uh, I think we're well shot of him, said George, with an uncharacteristically ugly look on his face. What's happened? Harry said. Yeah, I'm wondering that too. Percy and Dad had a row, said Fred. I've never seen Dad row with anyone like that. It's normally Mum who shouts. It was the first week back after term ended, said Ron. We were about to come, come and join the Order. Percy came home and told us he'd been promoted. You're kidding, said Harry. Though he knew perfectly well that Percy was highly ambitious. I'm going to turn this music down. Just a, just a tidge or a smidge. There we go. That's a little better. You're going to tell me what protrude the secret me meeting. Um, though he knew perfectly well that Percy was highly ambitious, Harry's impression was that Percy had not made a great success of his first job at the Ministry of Magic. Percy had committed the fairly large oversight of failing to notice that his boss was being controlled by Lord Voldemort. Not that the Ministry had believed it. They all thought Mr. Crouch had gone mad. Yeah, well, we were all surprised, said George. Because Percy got into a load of trouble after, about Crouch. There was an inquiry and everything. They said Percy ought to have realized Crouch was off his rocker and informed a superior. But, you know, Percy, Crouch left him in charge. He wasn't going to complain. So, how come they promoted him? Um, that's exactly what we wondered, said Ron, who seemed very keen to keep normal conversation going now that Harry had stopped yelling. <laughs> He came home really pleased with himself, even more pleased than usual, if you can imagine that, and told Dad he'd been offered a position in Fudge's own office. A really good one for someone only a year out of Hogwarts. Junior assistant to the minister. He expected Dad to be all impressed, I think. Only Dad wasn't, said Fred grimly. Oh, so only Dad wasn't, said Fred grimly. Why not? Well... Apparently Fudge has been storming around the ministry, checking that nobody's having, nobody's having any contact with Dumbledore, said George. Dumbledore's name is mud with the ministry these days, see, said Fred. They all think he's just making trouble, saying, you know who's back. Yeah, okay, so they're smearing him. They're smearing him. They're smearing his name. How dare they? How dare they besmirch the name of Dumbledore the Great? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, where, where were we? Where were we? Oh yeah. Uh, who's saying this? Oh yeah. Dad says Fred. Dad's, Dad says Fudge has made it clear that anyone who's in league with Dumbledore can clear out their desks. Said George. Uh, who's saying this? It's, it's, the, oh, it's still him. Okay. Trouble is, Fudge suspects Dad. He knows he's friendly with Dumbledore, and he's always thought Dad's a bit of a weirdo because of his Muggle obsession. What's that got to do with Percy? Asked Harry, confused. I'm coming to that. Dad reckons Fudge only wants Percy in his office because he wants to use him to spy on the family and Dumbledore. Harry let out a low whistle. <laughs> he just whistles really weirdly. Reaction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Harry, are you okay? Harry, stop it. Harry. <laughs> Uh, Harry let out a low whistle. Bet, bet Percy loved that. Ron laughed in a hollow sort of way. <laughs> he went completely berserk. He said, well, he said loads of terrible stuff. He said he's been having to struggle against Dad's lousy reputation ever since he joined the ministry and that Dad's got no ambition and that's why we've always been, you know, not had a load of money, I mean. Whoa, Percy, what a jerk. I don't like that. Nuh-uh. What? Said Harry in disbelief, as Ginny made a noise like an angry cat. <laughs> They're all just making weird noises. <laughs> uh, I know, said Ron in a low voice. And it got worse. He said Dad was an idiot to run around with Dumbledore. The Dumbledore was heading for big trouble. And Dad was going to go, uh, go down with him. And that he, Percy, knew where his loyalty lay. And it was with the Ministry. 
and if mum and dad were going to become traitors to the ministry, he was going to make sure everyone knew he didn't belong to our family anymore. And he packed his bags the same night and left. He's living here in London now. Whoa, man, that is too much. Harry swore under his breath, shit. <laughs> he had always liked Percy least of Ron's brothers, but he'd never imagined he would say such things to Mr. Weasley. Yeah, that's so crazy. That's so extreme. Okay. Mum's been in a right state, said Ron dully, you know, crying and stuff. She came up to London to try and talk to Percy, but he slammed the door in her face. I don't know what he does if he meets Dad at work. Ignores him, I suppose. Whoa, this, that's so intense, Percy. Wow. But Percy must know Voldemort's back, said Harry slowly. He's not stupid. He must know your mum and dad wouldn't risk everything without proof. Yeah, well, your name got dragged into the row, said Ron, shooting Harry a furtive look. Percy said the only evidence was your word, and I don't know, he didn't think it was good enough. Percy, ta uh, Percy takes the Daily Prophet seriously, said Hermione tartly, and the others all nodded. What are you talking about? Harry asked, looking around at them all. They were all regarding him warily. Haven't, haven't you been getting the Daily Prophet? Hermione asked nervously. Yeah, I have, said Harry. Have you uh, been reading it thoroughly? Hermione asked, still more anxiously. Not cover to cover, said Harry defensively. If they were going to report anything about Voldemort, it would be headline news, wouldn't it? The others flinched at the sound of the name. Hermione hurried on. Well, you'd need to read it cover to cover to pick it up, but they, um, they mention you a couple of times a week. But I'd have seen, not if you've only been reading the front page, you wouldn't, said Hermione, shaking her head. I'm not talking about big articles, they just slip you in like you're a standing joke. What do you, it's quite nasty, actually said Hermione in a voice of forced calm. They're just building on Rita's stuff. But she's not writing for them anymore, is she? Oh no, she kept her promise. Not that she's got any chance. <laughs> <laughs> what was it that she threatened? No, well, she's a bug now. Yeah. For how long is she a bug? A year or two years or something ridiculous. Oh, that's a long time to be a bug. <laughs> yeah. Man, just, to, it's... just eating plants and pooping. <laughs> Okay, um, where were we? Uh, Hermione added with satisfaction, but she, lay, but she laid the foundation for what they're trying to do now. Which is what, said Harry impatiently. Okay, you know she wrote that you were collapsing all over the place and saying your scar was hurting and all that? Yeah, said Harry, who was not likely to forget Rita Skeeter's stories about him in a hurry. Well, the writing about you as though you're this deluded, attention-seeking person who thinks he's a great tragic hero or something, said Hermione, very fast, as though it would be less unpleasant for Harry to hear these facts quickly. They keep slipping in sl snide comments about you. If some far-fetched story appears, they say something like, A tale worthy of Harry Potter. And if anyone has a funny accident or, or anything, uh, let's hope he hasn't got a scar on his forehead or we'll be asked to worship him next. I don't want anyone to worship, Harry began hotly. I know you don't, said Harry quick uh, Hermione quickly, looking frightened. I know, Harry, but you see what they're doing? They want to turn you into somebody nobody will believe. Fudge is behind it, I'll bet anything. They want wizards on the street to think they're just some stupid boy who, you're just su some stupid boy who's a bit of a joke, who tells ridiculously tall stories because he loves being famous and wants to keep going. I, I didn't ask, I, I didn't want, Voldemort killed my parents, Harry spluttered. I got famous because he murdered my family, but couldn't kill me. Who wants to be famous for that? Don't they think I'd rather it never, we, uh, we know Harry, said Ginny earnestly. And of course, they didn't report a word about the Dementors attacking you, said Hermione. Someone's told them to keep that quiet. That should have been a really big story. Out of control, Dementors. They haven't even reported that you broke the international stat uh, statutes of secrecy. secrecy. We thought they would. It would tie in so well with this image of you as some stupid show-off. We think they're biding their time until you're expelled. Then they're really going to go to town. I mean, if you're expelled, obviously, she went on hastily. You really shouldn't be, not if they abide by their own laws. There's no court uh, case against you. 
They were back on the, he uh, on the hearing, and Harry did not want to think about that. He cast around for another change of subject, but was... Say, uh, save the necessity. <laughs> save the necessity of finding one by the sound of footsteps coming up the stairs. Uh oh. Fred gave the extendable ear a hearty tug. There was another loud crack, and he and George vanished. Seconds later, Mrs. Weasley appeared in the bedroom window. Doorway, not the window. <laughs> I'm here! <laughs> The, meeting, the meeting's over. You can come down and have dinner now. Everybody's dying to see you, Harry. And who's left of all those dung... And who's left all those dung bongs... Dung bombs... Dung bongs... <laughs> dung bongs... Bombs outside the kitchen door. Crookshanks, said Ginny un unbashingly. He loves playing with them. Oh, said Mrs Weasley. I thought it might have been Creature. He keeps doing odd things like that. Creature? Creature? Who's Creature? Do we know who Creature is? K R E A C H E C H E R. C H E R. C H E R. The old C H. C. We, we don't. Okay. I thought it might have been creature. He, he keeps doing odd things like that. Now don't forget to keep your voices down in the hall. Ginny, your hands are filthy. What have you been doing? Don't wash them before dinner, please. Ginny grimaced at the others and followed her mother out of the room, leaving Harry alone with Ron and Hermione. Both of them were watching him apprehensively, as though they feared he would start shouting again now that everyone else had gone. The sight of them looked so of them looking so nervous made him feel slightly ashamed. Look, he muttered, but Ron shook his head, and Hermione said quietly, we knew you'd be angry, Harry. We really don't, don't blame you, but you've got to understand, we did try to pers persuade Dumbledore. Yeah, I know, said Harry shortly. He cast around for a topic that didn't involve his ha headmaster, because the very thought of Dumbledore made Harry's insides burn with anger again. Who's Creature? He, he asked. The house elf who lives here, said Ron. Nutter. Never met anyone like him. <laughs> Hermione frowned at Ron. He's not a nutter, Ron. His life's ambition is to have his head cut off and stuck on a plague, on a plague, a plaque, just like his mother, said Ron irritably. Is that normal, Hermione? Well, well, if he's a bit strange, it's not his fault. Ron rolled his eyes at Harry. Hermione still hasn't given up on spew. It's not spew, said Hermione heatedly. It's the Society for the Promotion of Elfish War uh, Welfare, and it's not just me. Dumbledore says we should, uh, we should be kind to Creature, too. He, yeah, yeah, said Ron. Come on, I'm starving. He led the way out of the door and onto the landing, but before they could descend the stairs... Hold it, Ron breathed, flinging out an arm to stop Harry and Hermione walking any further. They're still in the hall. We might be able to hear something. The three of them looked cautiously over the banisters. The gloomy hallway below was packed with witches and wizards, including all of Harry's guard. They were whispering excitedly together. In the very center of the group, Harry saw the dark, greasy-haired head and prominent nose of his least favorite teacher at Hogwarts, Professor Snoop. <laughs> Harry leaned further over the banisters. He was very interested in what, in what Snape was doing for the Order of the Phoenix. A thin piece of flesh-colored string descended in front of Harry's eyes. Looking up, he saw Fred and George on the landing above, cautiously lowering the extendable ear towards the dark knot of people below. Uh, a moment later, however, they all began to move towards the front door and out of sight. Oh, damn it! Harry heard Fred whisper as he hoisted the extendable ear back up, back up again. They heard the front door open, then close. Snape never eats here, Ron told Harry quietly. Thank God. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget to keep your voice down in the ha hall, Harry, Hermione whispered. As they passed the row of house, el house elf heads on the hall, they saw Lupin, Mrs. Weasley, and Tonks at the front door, magically sealing it in its many locks and bolts behind those who had just left. Uh, we're eating down in the kitchen, Mrs. Weasley whispered, meeting them at the bottom of the stairs. Hurry, dear, if you'll just tiptoe across the hall, it, it, it's through the, this door here. Crash! 
Oh, something's, something's gonna happen. Tonks! cried Mrs. Weasley in exasperation, turning to look behind her. Oh, I'm sorry, wailed Tonks, who was lying, lying, lying flat on the floor. It's that stupid umbrella stand. That's the second time I've tripped over. But the rest of her words were drowned by a horrible, ear-splitting, blood-curdling screech. <laughs> oh my god, it hurt. <laughs> okay, um... The moth-eaten velvet curtains Harry had passed earlier had flown apart, but there was no door behind them. For a split second, Harry thought he was looking through a window, a window behind which an old woman in a black cap was screaming and screaming as though she was being tortured. Then he realized it was simply a life-size portrait, but the most realistic and the most unpleasant he had ever seen in his life. Whoa, okay, what? The old woman was drooling. Her eyes were rolling. The yellowing skin of her face stretched taut as she screamed. And all along the hall behind them, the other portraits awoke and began to yell too, so that Harry actually screwed up his eyes at the noise and clapped his hands over his ears. Let's change this uh, music a little bit, shall we? Uh, a bit quieter. There we go. Yeah. Lupin and Mrs. Weasley darted forward and tried to tug the curtain shut over the old woman, but they would not close, and she screeched louder than ever, brandishing clawed hands as though trying to tear at their faces. Filth! Scum! Byproducts of dirt and vileness! Half-breeds! Mutants! Freaks! Be gone from this place! How dare you befoul the house of my father's! Tonks apologized over and over again, dragging the huge, heavy troll's leg back off the floor. Mrs. Weasley abandoned the attempt to close the curtains and hurried up and down the hall, stunning all the other portraits with her wand, and a man with long black hair came charging out of the door facing Harry. Long black hair. Shut up, you, you horrible old hag! Shut up! He roared, seizing the curtain Mrs. Weasley had abandoned. The old woman's face blanched. You! She howled, her eyes popping at the sight of the man. Blood traitor! Abomination! Shame of my flesh! I said, shut up! Roared the man. I don't know who he is. And with a stupendous effort, he and Lupin managed to force the curtains closed again. The old woman's screeches died and an echoing silence fell. Panting slightly and sweeping his long, dark hair out of his eyes, Harry's godfather, Sirius, turned to face him. <laughs> That's his voice now. <laughs> Hello, Harry! <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> You're drooling. You're laughing that much. Okay. Hello, Harry. Hello, Harry, he said grimly. I see you've met my mother. <laughs> what? His mother? <sighs> This is one of those times you can't go too big without that screaming. Didn't I just screech? Didn't I? Okay, maybe not. If, if she comes back up again, then I'll then I'll bring bring up that screech. Uh, okay, that's the end of that chapter. Uh, question for y'all. A little question for y'all. Um, I think I already asked these ones, didn't I? What's a hobby you're curious about and want to try and just haven't yet? I don't know if I have. Maybe I have. You throw that in there if not. Okay, uh, Sirius is back. Hell yeah! So down with that. I'm so down with Sirius being back. Ah, I miss that dude. All you get is letters. It's his mom. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine growing up with that? <laughs> with his mother? Eat your vegetables! <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, okay, oh, okay, mom. No, actually, he's like, okay, mom, yeah, sure. Eat them! <laughs> That's why he sounds like that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> you just imitate, like, you, you grow up imitating your parents, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Curfew is 10 a.m. What? Rita's not a bug. She, Hermione just kept Rita from telling any lies. And she said that she that she couldn't uh, write for a year. But, Rita Skeeter, but she's not a bug. What, 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 what does she have against Rita that Rita would adhere to that? Um, that she was, like, that, that she's an animagus. She's unregistered as an animagus, remember? Okay. That was the dirt that she had on her. Oh. She found out that she could Oh, right. Bug, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that makes but sense. she's not allowed to because she's not registered. That makes sense. Okay, cool. Thank you. 
Chapter 5, The Order of the Phoenix. Your my dear old mum, yeah, said Sirius. We've been trying to get her down for a month, but we think she put a permanent sticker ch sticking charm on the back of her canvas. Uh, let's get downstairs, quick, before they all wake up again. But what's a portrait of your mother doing here? Harry asked, bewildered, as they went through the door from the hall and led the way down a flight of narrow stone steps, the others just behind them. Hasn't anyone told you? This was my parents' house, said Sirius. But I'm the last black left, so it's mine now. I've, I offered it to Dumbledore for headquarters, but the only useful thing I've been able to do. Harry, who had expected a better welcome, noted how hard and bitter, okay, hard and bitter Sirius's voice sounded. Okay, it's more hard and bitter than that. He followed his godfather to the bottom of the steps and through a door leading into the basement kitchen. It was scarcely less gloomy, 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 uh, less, scarcely less gloomy than the hall above, a cavernous room with rough stone walls. Most of the light was coming from a large fire at the far end of the room. A haze of pipe smoke hung in the air like battle fumes, through which loomed the menacing shapes of heavy iron pots and pans hanging from the dark ceiling. Many chairs had been crammed into the room for the meeting, and a long wooden table stood in the middle of them, littered with rolls of parchment, goblets, empty wine bottles, and a heap of what appeared to be rags. Mr. Weasley and his eldest son Bill were talking quietly with their heads together at the end of the table. Um, I don't know if this really works anymore. Maybe it's a bit quieter. There we go. Um, where, where are we? Okay, yeah, okay. There he's sitting there. Mrs. Weasley cleared her throat. Her husband, a thin, balding, red-haired man who wore th horn-rimmed glasses, looked around and jumped to his feet. Hurry! Mr. Weasley said, hurrying forward to greet him and shaking his hand vigorously. <laughs> oh, good to see you. Over his shoulder, Harry saw Bill, who still wore his long hair and a ponytail, hastily rolling up the lengths of parchment left on the table. Journey all right, Harry? Bill called, trying to gather up 12 scrolls at once. He's so cool. He's, he's the coolest. <laughs> hey, hey, bow. <laughs> that's because that's what cool people do. That's what that's cool just, people he's do. He's not that kind of cool. He's real cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. That's, that's why it's so hard for you to be able to. Do this I don't think I've been like ever been real. You know. You know. In in high school, that you know. Actually, you know. Sometimes I te teach Shakespeare classes to to hi high school students. Very seldomly, but every once in a while, there's this one kid, and you're like, "Why am I intimidated by you? <laughs> why? What? What are you doing?" <laughs> They're just this kind of. What's up? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh damn, this kid is too cool for me. <laughs> Never been that. <laughs> um, Journey all right, Harry? Bill called, trying to gather up 12 scrolls at once. Mad I didn't make you come via Greenland then. He tried, said Tonks, striding over to help Bill and immediately toppling a candle onto the last piece of parchment. <laughs> She's a total klutz. She's a total klutz. Oh, oh no, sorry. <laughs> she, I bet her and Neville are going to get together or something. Oh no, she's way older than Neville. So that won't happen. That will not happen. Uh, uh, Here, dear, said Mrs. Weasley, sounding exasperated. And she repaired the parchment with a wave of her wand. In the flash of light caused by Mrs. Weasley's charm, Harry caught a glimpse of what looked like the plan of a building. Mrs. Weasley... Oh, interesting. Mrs. Weasley had seen him looking. She snatched the plan off the table and stuffed it into Bill's already overlaid in arms. This sort of thing ought to be cleared away promptly at the end of meetings, she snapped, before sweeping off towards an ancient dresser from which she started unloading dinner plates. Bill took out his wand, muttered, Evanesco. <laughs> the scrolls vanished. Sit down, Harry, said Sirius. You've met Mundungus, haven't you? The thing Harry had taken to be a pile of rags gave a prolonged, grunting snore, then jerked awake. <laughs> oh, yeah, Mundungus. He's, um, he, he's that cockney kind of guy. Yeah, he's that guy. There we go. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, some say, uh, something say my name. <laughs> <laughs> he's such a, such a blaze. Mundungus mumbles sleepy. I agree with Sirius. 
he, <laughs> he raised a very grubby hand in the air as though voting. <laughs> His droopy, bloodshot eyes unfocused. <laughs> Ginny giggled. The meeting's over, Dung, said Sirius, as they all sat down around him at the table. Harry's arrived. Aye, said Mundungus, peering balefully at Harry through his matted, gin matted ginger hair. Blimey, so he, so he has, yeah. You all right, Harry? <laughs> I like him. I like him. I like him. He's the one that, like, abandoned his post. Oh, yeah. This whole thing. Totally. I like his character. Uh, no, I like his written character. I don't know if I like his character, if that so makes sense. everybody in the Order is just like, ugh. <laughs> yeah, oh, come on, man. But he must be useful and powerful somehow, right? Yeah, said Harry. Mundungus fumbled nervously in his pockets, still staring at Harry, and pulled out a grimy black pipe. He stuck it in his mouth, ignited the end of it with his wand, and took a deep pull on it. Great billowing clouds of greenish smoke obscured him within seconds. Oh, you apology, grunted a voice from the middle of the smelly cloud. For the last time, Mundungus, called Mrs. Weasley, will you please not smoke that thing in the kitchen? Especially not when we're about to eat. Ah, said Mundungus. Right. Sorry, Molly. <laughs> I have met people like Yeah, that totally, me too. Life. Me too. <laughs> the cloud of smoke vanished as Mundungus stowed his pipe. One second. Some voices drive each to voices with some <laughs> I love that, Nathan. It's so good. Um, uh, uh, the cloud of smoke vanished as Mundungus stowed his pipe back into his pocket, but an acrid, acrid smell of burning socks lingered. <laughs> and if you want dinner before midnight, I'll need a hand, Mrs. Weasley, Measley said to the room at large. No, you can stay where you are, Harry dear. You've had a long journey. What can I do, Molly? said Tonks enthusiastic, enthusiastically, bounding forwards. Mrs. Weasley hesitating, lo, lo, hesitated, looking apprehensive. Uh, no, it's all right, Tonks. You have a rest too. You've done enough today. No, no, I want to help, said Tonks brightly, knocking over a chair as she hurried towards the dresser <laughs> from which Ginny was collecting cutlery. She's so clumsy. <laughs> uh... Soon a series of heavy knives were chopping meat and vegetables of their own accord, supervised by Mr. Mr. Weasley, while Mrs. Weasley stirred a cauldron dangling over the fire, and the others took out plates, more goblets. Okay, again, change this music back, because it's not creepy anymore. Jonah, have you updated your character list? Lol, so many new characters already. Uh, no, actually not with the new characters. I haven't, no. It's all up here, you know, in this vast, empty hallway. Yeah, we know how empty it is. Huh? <laughs> uh, supervised by Mr. Weasley, while Mrs. Weasley stirred a cauldron dangling over the fire, and the others took out plates, more goblets, and food from the pantry. Harry was left at the table with Sirius and Mundungus, who was still blinking at him mournfully. Say no figgy since, he asked. No, said Harry. I haven't seen anyone. See, I wouldn't have left said Mundungus, leaning forward, a pleading note in his voice. But I, I had a business opportunity. <laughs> I love him. I, I really like him. Harry felt something brush against his knees and started, but it was only Crookshanks. Hermione's bandy-legged ginger cat, who wound himself, wound himself once around Harry's legs, purring, then jumped onto Sirius' lap and curled up. Sirius scratched him absent-mindedly behind the ears as he turned. Still grim-faced to Harry. Had a good summer so far? No, it's been lousy, said Harry. For the first time, something like a grin flitted across Sirius' face. Don't know what you're complaining about myself. What? said Harry incredul incredulously. Personally, I'd have welcomed a, welcomed a demento attack. A deadly struggle for my soul would have, would have broken the monotony nicely. <laughs> <laughs> You think you've had it bad? At least you've been able to get out and about, stretch your legs, get into a few fights. I've been stuck inside for a month. How come? asked Harry, frowning. Because the Ministry of Magic's still after me. 
and Voldemort will know all about me being an Animagus by now. Wormtail would have told him. So, my big disguise is useless. There's not much I can do for the Order of the Phoenix. Or so Dumbledore feels. There was something about the slightly flattened tone of voice in which Sirius uttered Dumbledore's name that told Harry that Sirius, too, was not very happy with the headmaster. Harry felt a sudden upsurge of affection for his godfather. You know what? No matter what anybody says, Dumbledore can do no wrong. I bet he's one of those characters in this series that just doesn't sin. <laughs> he... I bet he won't have one fault throughout the entire series. He's just like such a perfect character. They're gonna be like, oh, screw you, screw you, and all, at the end they'll be like, yeah, that was a good plan. That was, a, that was a, yeah, you're right, Dumbledore, you're completely right. That's how it's gonna be. That's how it's gonna go. Oh, wait, 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 that's my. It's time to Except you already heard it, so let's move on. There was something, uh, at least you've known what's been going on, he said bracingly. Oh, yeah, said Sirius sarcastically, listening to Snape's rip. <laughs> what, what are you laughing about? Because <laughs> anytime anybody ever says, oh, yeah, I'm just like, Kool Aid guy. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> said Sirius sarcastically. Listening to Snape's reports, having to take all his snide hints that he's out there risking his life while I'm sitting on my backside here having a nice, comfortable time. Ask me how the cleaning's going. What cleaning? said asked Harry. Trying to make this place fit for human habitation, said Sirius, waving a hand around the dismal kitchen. No one lived here for ten years, not since my dear mother died. Unless you count her old house elf, and he's gone round a twist. Hasn't cleaned anything in ages. Sirius. Uh, Sirius, said Mundungus, who did not appear to have paid any attention to the conversation, but had been closely examining an empty goblet. This silver solid, mate. <laughs> he's so funny. He's so funny. I love him. What did he say? This silver, mate. <laughs> this solid silver. <laughs> Ah, oh, so good. Yes, said Sirius, surveying it with distaste. Finest 15th century goblin wrought silver, embossed with the black family crest. Turning the page, turning the page. That come off. Uh, that come off, though, muttered Mundungus, polishing with his cuff. Fred, George, no, just carry them, Mrs. Weasley shrieked. Harry, Sirius, and Mundungus looked around, and within a split second, they had dived away from the table. Fred and George had bewitched a large cauldron of stew, an iron flagon of butter beer, and a heavy, heavy, heavy wooden brood, breadboard, brood bed, breadboard, complete with knife, to hurtle through the air towards them. <laughs> maniacs. Complete maniacs. The stew skidded the length of the table and came to a halt just before the end, leaving a long black burn on the wooden surface. The flagon of butter beer fell with a crash, spilling its contents everywhere. The bread knife slipped off the board and landed, point down and quivering ominously, exactly where Sirius' right hand had been seconds before. For heaven's sake, screamed Mrs. Weasley. There was no need. I've had enough of this. Just because you're allowed to use magic now, you don't have to whip your hands out for every tiny little thing. We, we, we were just trying to save a bit of time, said Fred, hurrying forward to wrench the bread knife out of the table. Sorry, Sirius, mate. <laughs> Didn't mean to. Harry and Sirius were both laughing. <laughs> Mundungus, who had toppled backwards off his chair, was swearing as he got to his feet. Crookshanks had given an angry hiss as, uh, and shot off under the dresser from where his large yellow eyes glowed in the darkness. Boys, Mr. Weasley said, lifting the stew back into the middle of the table. Your mother's right. You're supposed to show a sense of responsibility now you've come of age. None of your brothers caused this sort of trouble. Mrs. Weasley raged at the twins as she slammed a fresh flagon of butterbeer onto, onto, <coughs> onto the table and spilling almost as much again. Bill didn't feel the need to apparate every few feet. Charlie didn't charm everything he met. 
Percy! She stopped dead, catching her breath with a frightened look at her husband, whose expression was suddenly wooden. Let's eat, said, said Bill quickly. It looks, it looks wonderful, Molly, said Lupin, ladling stew onto a plate for her and handing it across the table. Oh, too tense, too tense. Family tense. That's the worst kind of tense. <laughs> for a few minutes there was, a, there was silence, but for the chink of plaints and cutlery and the scraping of chairs as everyone settled down to their food. Then Mrs. Weasley turned to Sirius. I've been meaning to tell you, Sirius. There's something trapped in that writing desk in the right in, in the drawing room. It keeps rattling and shaking. Of course, could just be a bugger. And I thought we might, we ought to ask Alistair to have a look at it before we let that before, before we let it out. Whatever you like," said Sirius indifferently. "The curtains are in there are full of doxies too," Mrs. Weasley went on. "I thought we might try and tackle them tomorrow. Doxies, eh? Did we we didn't meet some doxies yet, hey?" A new creature to be fascinated and bewildered with. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to it, said Sirius. Her Harry heard the sarcasm in his voice, but he was not s sure that anyone else did. Opposite Harry, Tonks was entertaining Hermione and Ginny by transforming her nose between mouthfuls. She's awesome. Screwing up her eyes each time with the same pained expression she had worn back in Harry's bedroom. Her nose swelled to a beak-like protuberance that resembled Snape's, shrank to the size of a button mushroom, and then sprouted a great deal of hair from each nostril. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, this was a regular mealtime entertainment, because Hermione and Ginny were soon requesting their favorite noses. Do that one like a pig snout, Tonks! Tonks obliged, and Harry, looking up, had the fleeting impression that the female Dudley was grinning at him from across the table. Ooh. Just like, <laughs> that's the grin. <laughs> yeah. I wish your cam worked. I don't know where it's working. Another, another thing I have to fix. Normally, he would be there. Is ever is everything connected? I mean, yeah. Well, right here is. Weird. I don't know about where it else is connected. Oh well, we'll figure it out for tomorrow. Uh. Okay, let's keep going. Um, we're having it. Mrs. We Mr. Weasley, Bill, and Lupin were having an intense discussion about goblins. And not giving anything away yet, said Bill. I still can't work out whether or not they believe he's back. Of course, they might prefer not to take sides at all. Keep out of it. I'm sure they never go over to you know who, said Mr. Weasley, shaking his head. They've suffered losses too. Remember that goblin family he murdered last time? Someone near, near, somewhere near Nottingham. I think it depends what they're offered, said Lupin, and I'm not talking about gold. If they're offered the freedoms we've been denying them for centuries, they're going to be tempted. Have you still not had any luck with Ragnarok, Bill? Wait, oh, that was Lupin the whole time. Okay, that was Lupin the whole time. I thought it was Bill responding. Uh, he's feeling pretty anti-wizard at the moment, said Bill. He hasn't stopped raging about the bagman business. He reckons the Ministry did a cover-up. Those goblins never got their gold from him, you know. A gale of laughter from the middle of the table drowned the rest of Bill's words. Fred, George, Ron, and Mundungus were rolling around in their seats. <laughs> and then, choked Mundungus, tears roll running down his face. And then, if you'll believe it, he says to me, <laughs> he says, Ear done, where'd you get all them toads from? Because some, cause some son of a bludge has gone and nicked all mine. <laughs> and I says, nicked all your toads, Will. What next? So you'll be wanting some more then, and if you'll believe me, lads, eh? The gov the gormless gargoyle buys the gormless gargoyle buys all his own toads back off me for a lot more more pay in the first place. <laughs> I don't think we need to hear any more of your business dealings, thank you very much, Mundungus, <laughs> said Mrs. Weasley sharply. <laughs> as Rod slumped forwards on the table howling with laughter. <laughs> <laughs> she hates him so much. She doesn't like him, him at all. <laughs> uh, 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 beg pardon, Molly. Oh, uh, beg pardon, Molly, said Mundungus at once, wiping his eyes and winking at Harry. But, you know, we'll nick, to, uh, we'll nick them off Warty Harris in the first place, so I wasn't really doing nothing wrong. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't know where you learned about right and wrong, Mungungus, but you seem to have missed a few crucial lessons, said Mrs. Weasley coldly. Fred and George buried their faces in their goblets of butterbeer. George was hiccuping. For some reason, Mrs. Weasley threw a very nasty look at Sirius before getting to her feet and going to fetch a large rhubarb crumble for pudding. Harry looked round for his godfather. Molly doesn't approve of Mundungus, said Sirius in an undertone. How come he's in the order? Harry said very quietly. He's useful, Sirius muttered. Knows all the crooks. Well, he would, seeing as he's one himself. <coughs> Um, but he's also very loyal to Dumbledore, who helped him out of... <laughs> Sorry, I got something stuck. Cough, 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 cough. Okay. We're back, baby! We're back! <laughs> who helped him out of a tight spot once. It pays to have someone like Dung around. He hears things we don't, but Molly thinks inviting him to stay for dinner is going too far. She hasn't forgiven him for slipping off duty when he was supposed to be tailing you. Three helpings of rhubarb crumble and custard later. The waistband on Harry's jeans was feeling uncomfortably tight, which was saying something, as the jeans had once been Dudley's. What? Oh, oh, he, he, got, he got the hand-me-downs. Okay, yeah. As he laid down his spoon, there was a, a lull in the general conversation. Mr. Weasley was leaning back in his chair, looking replete and relaxed. Tonks was yawning wide, widely, her nose now back to normal, and Ginny, who had lured Crookshanks out from under the dresser, was sitting cross-legged on the floor, rolling butterbeer corks for him to chase. Nearly bedtime, nearly time for bed, I think, said Mrs. Weasley with a yawn. Not just yet, Molly, said Sirius, pushing away his empty plate and turning to look at Harry. I know, I'm surprised at you. I thought the first thing you'd do when you got here would be to... Start asking questions about Voldemort. The atmosphere in the room changed with a rapid, with rapidity, with the rapidity Harry associated with the arrival of the of the mentors, where seconds before it had been sleepily relaxed, it was now alert, even tense. Okay, finally we get some kind of answer, answers. I'm feeling the same way. I want to know what's happening. Your poor throat. Seriously, the great voice, but take care of those vocal cords. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. There's like a certain thing I hit where it doesn't hurt and, th and then sometimes I just actually slip into it and then that happens but usually it's fine and it's not hurting then um, a frisson had gone ra around the table at the mention of Voldemort's name Lupin who had been about to take a sip of wine lowered his goblet slowly looking warily I did said Harry indignantly I asked Ron and Hermione but they said that we're not allowed in the order so and they're quite right said Mrs. Weasley you're too young. She was sitting bolt upright in her chair, her fists clenched on its arms, every trace of drowsiness gone. Since when did someone have to be in the order of the Phoenix to ask questions? Asked Sirius. Harry's been trapped in that muggle house for a month. He's got, he's got the right to know what's been happening. Oh, it's George. Hang on, interrupted George loudly. How come Harry gets his questions answered? Said Fred angrily. We've been trying to get stuff out of you for a month, and you haven't told us a single stinking thing, said George. You're too young. You're not in the order, said Fred, said Fred, in a high-pitched voice that sounded uncannily like his mother's. Harry's not even of age. Turning the page. It's not my fault you haven't been told what the order's doing, said Sirius calmly. That's your parents' decision. Harry, on the other hand. It's not down to you to decide what's good for Harry, said Mrs. Weasley sharply. The expression on her normally kind face looked dangerous. You haven't forgotten what Dumbledore said, I suppose. Which bit? Sirius asked politely, but with the air of a man readying himself for a fight. The bit about not telling Harry more than he needs to know, said Mrs. Weasley, pacing, placing a heavy emphasis on the last three words. Ron, Hermione, Fred, and George's head, taking it off because it's too hot. <laughs> Keep matching shirt colors. I know. Weird. All right. Check it out. The, the, these are all um, Dexter's bouncy balls. Well, I thought you were showing off your guns. <laughs> yeah. Check it out, everybody. <laughs> um, okay. 
Ron, Hermione, Fred, and George's heads swiveled from Sirius to Mrs. Weasley as though they were following a tennis rally. George, Ginny was kneeling amid a pile of abandoned butter beer corks, watching the conversation with her mouth slightly open. Lupin's eyes were fixed on Sirius. I don't intend to tell him more than he, than he needs to know, Molly, said Sirius, but as he was the one who saw Voldemort come back. Again, there was a collective shudder around the table at the name. He has more right than most to... He's not a member. No. He's not a member of the Order of the Phoenix, said the Mrs. Weasley. He's only 15 and... And he's dealt with as much as most in the Order, said Sirius, and more than some. No one's denying what he's done, said Mrs. Weasley, her voice rising, her fists trembling on the arms of her chair. But he's still... He's not a child, said Sirius impatiently. He's not an adult either, said Mrs. Weasley, the color rising in her cheeks. He's not James, Sirius. He is, thanks, Molly, said Sirius coldly. I'm not sure you are, said Mrs. Weasley. Sometimes, the way you talk about him, it's as though you think you've got your best friend back. What's wrong with that, said Harry. What's wrong, Harry, is that you, you are not your father. However much you might look like him, said Mrs. Weasley, her eyes still boring into Sirius, you are still at school and adults responsible for you should not forget it. Meaning I'm an irresponsible godfather, demanded Sirius, his voice rising. Meaning you've been known to act rashly, Sirius, which is why Dumbledore keeps reminding you to stay at home. We'll, we'll leave my instructions from Dumbledore out of this, if you please, said Sirius loudly. Arthur! said Mrs. Miss, Miss, uh, Arthur, said Mrs. Weasley, rounding on her husband. Arthur, back me up. <laughs> Mr. Weasley did not speak at once. He took off his glasses and cleaned them slowly on his robes, not looking at his wife. Only when he had replaced them carefully on his nose did he reply. Dumbledore knows the position has changed, Molly. He accepts that Harry will have to be filled in to a certain extent, now that he is staying at headquarters. Yes, but there's a difference between that and inviting him to ask whatever he likes. Personally, said Lupin quietly, looking away from Sirius at last, as Mrs. Weasley turned quickly to him, hopeful that finally she was about to get an ally. I think it better to, I think it better that Harry gets the facts, not all the facts, Molly, but the general picture from us, rather than a garbled version from others. His expression was mild, but Harry felt sure Lupin, at least, knew that some extendable ears had survived Mrs. Weasley's purge. Well, said Mrs. Weasley, breathing deeply and looking around the table for support that did not come. Well, I can see I'm going to be overruled. I'll just say this. Dumbledore must have had his reasons for not wanting Harry to know too much. And speaking as someone who has Harry's best, best interests at heart... He's not your son, said Sirius quietly. He's as good as, said Mrs. Weasley fiercely. Who else has he got? He's got me. Yes, said Mrs. Weasley, her lip curling. The thing is, it's been rather difficult for you to look after him while you've been locked up in Azkaban, hasn't it? Oh man, this is like a parent fight. This is a parent fight. Sirius started to rise from his chair. Molly, you're not the only person at this table who cares about Harry, said Lupin sharply. Oh, so Lupin, sorry. Molly, you're not the only person at this table who cares about Harry, said Lupin sharply. Sirius, sit down. Mrs. Weasley's low, lower lip was trembling. Sirius sank slowly back into his chair, his face white. I think Harry ought to be allowed to say in this, Lupin continued. He's old enough to decide for himself. I want to know what's been going on, Harry said at once. He did not look at Mrs. Weasley. He had been touched by what she had said about his, his being as good as his son, but he was also impatient with her molly cuddling. Sirius was right. He was not a child. Very well, said Mrs. Weasley, her voice cracking. Ginny, Ron, Hermione... Fred, George, I want you out of this kitchen now. There was instant uproar. We're of age, Fred and George bellowed together. If Harry's allowed, why can't I? Shouted Ron. Mum, I want to hear. No, shouted Mrs. Weasley, standing up, her eyes over bright. I absolutely forbid. Molly, you can't stop Fred and George, said Mr. Weasley wearily. They are 
They are of age. They're still at school, but they're legally adults now, said Mr. Weasley in the same tired voice. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Weasley was now scarlet in the face. I, all right then. Fred and George can stay, but Ron... Harry will tell me and Hermione everything you say anyway, said Ron hotly. <laughs> won't, won't, won't you, he added uncertainly, and, uh, won't, won't you, he added uncertainly, meeting Harry's eyes. For a split second, Harry considered telling Ron that he wouldn't tell him a single word, that he could try a taste of being kept in the dark and see how he liked it. But the nasty impulse vanished as they looked at each other. Of course I will, Harry said. Ron and Hermione beamed. Fine! shouted Mrs. Weasley. Fine! Ginny, bed! <laughs> Ginny did not go quietly. They could hear her raging and storming at her mother all the way up the stairs. And when she reached the hall, Mrs. Black's ears, ear-splitting shrieks were added to the din. <laughs> Lupin hurried off to the portrait to restore, restore calm. calm. It was only after he had returned, closing the kitchen door behind him and taking his seat at the table again, that Sirius spoke. Remember when Ginny first came about and I gave her this really stupid baby voice? <laughs> what was he like? But I want to really badly! Or something like that. Imagine if Ginny was like that throughout the whole series. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, okay, Harry. What do you want to know? Harry took a deep breath and asked the question that had obsessed him for the last month. Where's Voldemort? He said, ignoring the renewed shudders and, and winces at the name. What's he doing? I've been trying to watch the Muggle news, and there hasn't been anything that looks like him yet. No funny deaths or anything. That's because there, there, hasn't, that's because there haven't been any funny deaths yet, said Sirius. Not as far as we know, anyway. And we know quite a lot more than he thinks we do, anyway said Lupin. How come, he how come he'd stopped killing people? Harry asked. He knew Voldemort had murdered more than once in the last year alone. Because he doesn't want to draw attention to himself, said Sirius. It would be dangerous for him. His comeback didn't come off quite the way he wanted to, you see. He messed it up. Or rather, you messed it up for him, said Lupin, with a satisfied smile. How? Harry asked, perplexed. You weren't supposed to survive, said Sirius. Nobody apart from his Death Eaters was supposed to know he'd come back. But you survived to bear witness. Thank you, healthcare workers! <laughs> Seven o'clock. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're still working away. You're still working away. You're doing it for us. You're saving some lives. Oh, oh, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for reminding me, everybody. I don't know what the delay is on here. Because right now, the last thing I think I'm seeing is Dan Spence a whole bunch of a bunch of applause hands. So I don't know how far back that is on yours. There's two others right now. Okay, so that's not that's not too far back. Well, that's fine. Good. Um, uh, and the very last person he wanted alerted to his return the moment he got back was Dumbledore, said Lupin. And you made sure Dumbledore knew at once. How has that helped? Harry asked. <laughs> Are you kidding? said Bill incredulously. Dumbledore was the only one you know who was ever scared of. Thanks to you, D uh, wait. Thanks to you, Dumbledore was able to recall the Order of the Phoenix about an hour after Voldemort returned, said Sirius. So, what's the Order been doing, said Harry, looking around at them all. Dumbledore recalled the Order. Recalled, so they, they already existed once. So, my guess is they're the counter... They're the counterforce to all the Death Eaters. Yeah. yeah. And I'm wondering if Outside they, the I'm wondering if they have allegiance to the Ministry of Magic, or that the Ministry of Magic commands them, or, or now, or they now are have a split off from that. Yeah. Different kind of. The delay is about forty seconds. That's a lot. Holy smokes. Well, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to figure out some stuff. Um. We're working as hard as we can to make sure Voldemort can't carry out his plans, said Sirius. How do you know what his plans are? Harry asked quickly. Dumbledore's got a shrewd, Dumbledore's got a shrewd idea, said Lupin. And Dumbledore's shrewd ideas normally turn out to be accurate. So what does Dumbledore reckon he's planning? Well, 
Firstly, he wants to build up his army again, said Sirius. In the old days, he had huge numbers at his command. Witches and wizards he'd bullied or bewitched into following him. His faithful Death Eaters, a great variety of dark creatures. You heard him planning to recruit the giants? Well, they'll be just one of the groups he's after. He's certainly not going to try and take on the Ministry of Magic with only a dozen Death Eaters. So you're trying to stop him getting more followers? We're doing our best, said Lupin. How? Well, the main thing is to try and convince as many people as possible that you know who really has returned. To put them, to put them on their guard, said Bill. It's proving, tri it's proving tricky, though. Why? Because of the Ministry's attitude, said Tonks. You saw Cornelius fudge after you know who's come back, Harry. Well, he hasn't shifted his position at all. He's absolutely refusing to believe it happened. But why, said Harry desperately, why is he being so stupid? If Dumbledore... Ah, well, you've put your finger on the problem, said Mr. Weasley with a wry smile. Dumbledore. Fudge is frightened of him, you see, said... Uh, Fudge is... Fudge is frightened of him, you see, said Tonks sadly. Frightened of Dumbledore, said Harry incredul incredulously. Frightened of what he's up to, said Mr. Weasley. Fudge thinks Dumbledore's plotting to overthrow him. He thinks Dumbledore wants to be Minister for Magic. But Dumbledore doesn't want... Of course he doesn't, said Mr. Weasley. He's never wanted the minister job, minister's job, even though a lot of people wanting him to take it when Millicent Bagnold retired. Fudge came to power instead but he's never quite forgotten how much popular support Dumbledore had, even though Dumbledore never applied for the job. Who is this? It's still him. Uh, oh no, Lupin. Deep down, Fudge knows Dumbledore is much cleverer than he is, a much more powerful wizard, and in the early days of his ministry, he was forever asking Dumbledore for help and advice, said Lupin. But it seems he's become fond of power and much more confident. He loves being Minister for Magic, and he's managed to convince himself that he's the clever one, and Dumbledore's simply stirring up trouble for the sake of it. Your Lupin voice cracks me up. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, how can he think that, said Harry angrily? How can he think Dumbledore would just make it all up, that I'd make it all up? This. Because accepting that Voldemort's back would mean trouble like the Ministry hasn't had to cope with for nearly 14 years, said F Sirius bitterly. Fudge just can't bring himself to face it. It's so much more comfortable to convince himself Dumbledore's lying to destabilize him. You see the problem, said Lupin. While well, the Ministry insists there's nothing to fear from Voldemort, it's hard to convince people he's back especially as they really don't want to believe it in the first place. What's more, the Ministry is leaning heavily on the Daily Prophet, not to report any of what they're calling Dumbledore's rumour-mongering. So, most of the wizarding community are completely unaware anything's happened, and that makes them easy targets for the Death Eaters if they're using the Imperious Curse. Man! Stupid fudge! Fudge is so dumb! <laughs> I just want to slap you right in your tonsils. How can you do that? Oh man, make your hand small enough, you get in there, then make that hand big and go BAM! <laughs> slap it, slap it, slap it, slap it, slap it. Uh, comment lag on Instagram at well. Oh yeah, there was. There are a lot of different voices in this room. You're killing this reading. Thank you, Natasha. Appreciate, appreciate that, Natasha Torres. Um, but you're telling them, aren't you? said Harry, looking around at Mr. Weasley, Sirius, Bill, Mundungus, Lupin, and Tonks. You're letting know, you're letting people know he's back. They all smiled humorous, humorlessly. Well, as everyone thinks I'm a mad, mad m mass murderer, and the Ministry's put a t uh, 10,000 galleon price on my head, I can hardly stroll up the street and start handing out leaflets, can I? said Sirius rest restlessly. And I'm not a very popular dinner guest with most of the community, said Lupin. It's an occupational hazard of being a werewolf. Mm. Tonks, um... Tonks and Arthur would lose their jobs at the Ministry if they started shooting their mouths off, said Sirius. And it's very important for us to have spies inside the Ministry, because you can bet Voldemort will have them. Oh. 
We've managed to convince a couple of people, though, said Mr. Weasley. Tonks here, for one. She's too young to have been in the Order of the Phoenix last time, and having auras on our side is a huge advantage. Advantage. Kingsley Shacklebolt's been a real asset, too. He's in charge of the hunt for Sirius, so he's been feeding the Ministry information that Sirius is in Tibet. <laughs> but if none of you are putting the news out that Voldemort's back, Harry began. Who said none of us are putting the news out, said Sirius. Why do you think Dumbledore's in such trouble? What do you mean? Harry asked. They're trying to discredit him, said Lupin. Didn't you see the Daily Prophet last week? They reported that he'd been voted out of the chairmanship of the International Confederation of Wizards because he's getting old and losing his grip. But it's not true. He was voted out by the Ministry, by ministry Wizards after he made a speech announcing Voldemort's return. They've demoted him from Chief Warlock on the Wizen, on the Wizen Gamut. That's the Wizard High Cat. Okay, wait. They've demoted him from Chief Warlock on the Wizen Gamut. That's the Wizard High Court. And they're talking about taking away his Order of Merlin, first class too. What? Poor Voldemort. That sucks. Man, liking these people and uh, people uh, less and less. Okay. Uh. But Dum uh, wait, 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 uh, wait, wait, Bill. But Dumbledore says he doesn't care what they do as long as they don't take him off the chocolate frog cards, said Bill, grinning. <laughs> of course. Of course, he just loves his treats. Uh, it's no laughing matter, said Mr. Weasley sharply. If he carries on defying the Ministry like this, he could end up in Azkaban. And the last thing, w the last thing we want is to have Dumbledore locked up. Well, you know who's... Uh, knows Dumbledore's out there and why as to what he's up to, he's going to go cautiously. If Dumbledore's out of the way, well, you know who will have a clear field. But if Voldemort's trying to recruit more Death Eaters, it's bound to get out, out he's, he's come back, isn't it? Asked Harry desperately. Sings. Voldemort doesn't march up to people's houses and bang on their front doors, Harry, said Sirius. He tricks, jinxes, and blackmails them. He is well practiced at operating in secret. In any case, gathering followers is only one thing what the only one thing he's interested in. He's got other plans too. Plans he can put into operation very quietly indeed. And he's concentrating on those for the moment. What's he after for, apart from followers? Harry asked swiftly. He thought he saw Sirius and Lupin exchange the most fleeting of looks before Sirius answered. Stuff. He can only get by stealth. When Harry continued to look puzzled, Sirius said, Like a weapon. Something he didn't have last time. When he was powerful before? Yes. What kind of weapon? said Harry. Something worse than the Ava Avada Kedavra. That's enough! Mrs. Uh, That's enough! Mrs. Weasley spoke from the shadows beside the door. <laughs> She's just hiding the shadows. <laughs> oh. Harry hadn't noticed her return from taking Ginny upstairs. Her arms were crossed and she looked furious. I want you in bed now, all of you, she added, looking around at Fred, George, Ron, and Hermione. <laughs> you can't boss us, Fred began. Watch me, snarled <laughs> Mrs. Weasley. She was trembling slightly as she looked at Sirius. You've given Harry plenty of information. Any more, and you might as well, m might just as well induct him into the order straight away. Why not? Said Harry quickly. I'll join. I want to join. I want to fight. No. It was not. Oh, no. It was not Mrs. Weasley who spoke this time, but Lupin. The order is comprised only of overage wizards. He said, "Wizards who have left school." He added, as Fred and George opened their mouths. There are dangers involved of which you can have no idea, any of you. I think Molly's right, Sirius. We've said enough. Sirius half shrugged, but did not argue. Mrs. Weasley beckoned imperiously to her son, sons and Hermione. One by one, they stood up, and Harry, recognizing the feat, followed suit. Okay, I'm going to go longer than this. Don't you worry. You said poor Voldemort instead of poor Dumbledore. No, I'm I'm feeling a lot for Voldemort. You know, I mean, you're you're a slime-covered baby, freak, f slob, for how long? Twenty years? No, fifteen years? And and you know nobody cares about you. 
and finally you awaken, you see all your friends. You're like, hey man, you didn't come back for me, what the heck? You see all your friends and then a, then a teenage kid comes and ruins your party. Like, how would you feel, Mark? Um, you know what I think right now? I think the overwhelming majority of the people in the chat would ask me to smack you a little. What, my tonsils? <laughs> <laughs> Onwards! Onwards and upwards! Chapter 6, The Noble and Most Ancient House of Black. Mrs. Weasley followed them upstairs, looking grim. I want you all to go straight to bed. No talking, she said as they reached the first landing. We've got a busy day tomorrow. I expect Ginny's asleep, she added to Hermione. So try not to wake her up. <laughs> asleep? Yeah, right, said Fred in an undertone. See, see you later, HD, HRD, herder, herder, dev, herder, herder. Uh, after, after Hermione bade them good night and they were climbing to the next floor. Uh, uh, if Ginny's not lying awake waiting for Hermione to tell her everything they said downstairs, then I'm a flubberworm. <laughs> flubberworm. <laughs> All right, Ron, Harry, said Mrs. Weasley on the second landing, pointing them into their bedroom. Off to bed with you. Night, Harry and Ron said to the twins. Sleep tight, said Fred, winking. Mrs. Weasley closed the door behind Harry with a sharp snap. The bedroom looked, if anything, even danker and gloomier than it had on the first night. The blank picture on the wall was now breathing slowly and deeply, as though its invisible occupant was asleep. Harry put on his pajamas, took off his glasses, and climbed into his chilly bed while Ron threw owl treats up. <laughs> well, well, oh, I thought, sorry, I was, I was reading Hedwig, not, not Ron. I thought I Hedwig was just like throwing owl treats up. Well, Ron threw owl treats up on top of the wardrobe to pacify Hedwig and Pigwidgeon, who were clattering around and rustling their wings restlessly. We can't let them out to hunt every night, Ron explained as he pulled on his maroon pajamas. Dumbledore doesn't want too many owls swooping around the square. Thinks it looks suspicious. Oh, yeah, I forgot. He crossed to the door and bolted it. What are you doing that for? Creature, said Ron as he turned off the light. First time I was here, he came wandering in at three in the morning. Trust me, you don't want to wake up and find him prowling around your room. Anyway, he got to his bed. <laughs> I want to know what this creature thing is. What the heck? They said it's an owl. Oh, right. Yeah, I just forgot his name. I was like picturing this monster or something that kind of walks in. <laughs> He got into his bed, settled down under the covers, then turned to look at Harry in the darkness. Harry could see his outline by the moonlight, filtering in through the grimy window. What do you reckon? Harry didn't need to ask what Ron meant. Well, they didn't tell us much we couldn't have guessed, did they? He said, thinking of all that had been said downstairs. I mean, all they've really said is that the order is trying to stop people joining. Vo there was a sharp intake of breath from Ron. Demort, said Harry firmly. When are you going to start using his name? Sirius and Lupin do. Ron ignored his, this last comment. Yeah, you're right, he said. We already knew nearly everything they told us from using the extendable ears. The, the only new bit was crack. Ouch! Keep your voice down, Ron, or Mum will be back up here. What? Oh, Fred and George. Keep your voice down, Ron, or Mum will be up, be up, be back up here. You just, you two just apparated on my knees. Yeah, well, it's hot in the dark. <laughs> Harry saw the blurred outlines of Fred and George leaping down from Ron's bed. There was a groan of bed, string, bed, bed springs and Harry's mattress descended a few inches as George sat down near his feet. So, got there yet? said George eagerly. The weapon, Sirius mentioned, said Harry. Let's slip more like, said Fred with relish, now sitting next to Ron. We didn't hear about that on the old extendables, did we? What do you reckon it is? said Harry. Could be anything, said Fred. But there can't be anything worse than the Avacadavra curse, can there? said Ron. What's worse than death? Maybe it's something that can kill loads of people at once, suggested George. Maybe it's some particularly painful way of killing people, said Ron fearfully. He's got the, he's got the cru, uh, cruciate, this word, cruciatus, cruciatus. He's got the cruciatus curse for causing pain said Harry. He doesn't need anything more efficient than that. There was a pause, 
and Harry knew that the others, like him, were wondering what hor horrors this weapon could perpetrate. So, who do you think's got it now? asked George. I hope it's our side, said Ron, sounding slightly nervous. If, it's, if it is, Double is probably keeping it, said Fred. Where? said Ron quickly. Hogwarts? But it is, said George. That's where he hit the Philosopher's Stone. A weapon's going to be a lot bigger than the stone, though, said Ron. Not necessarily, said Fred. Yeah, size is no guarantee of power, said George. Look at Ginny. What do you mean, said Harry. You've never been on the receiving end of one of her bat bogey hexes, have you? Shh, said Fred, half rising from the bed. Listen. They fell asleep. Footsteps were coming up the stairs. Mum, said George, and without further ado, there was a loud crack, and Harry felt the wa white weight vanish from the end of his bed. A few seconds later, they heard the floorboard creak outside their door. Mrs. Weasley was painfully listening to check whether or not they were talking. I remember this kind of thing. You know? Remember when, when your parents would, like, listen at the door? And you'd be like, oh, I know you're out there. Just be as quiet as possible until you pass. <laughs> okay, yeah, just listening. Okay, they're gone. <laughs> uh, where were we? She was... Uh... uh... Yeah. Hedwig, Hedwig and Pigwidgeon hooted dolefully. The floorboard creaked again, and they heard her heading upstairs to check on Fred and George. She doesn't trust us all. Us at all, you know, said Ron regretfully. Harry was sure he would not be able to fall asleep. The evening had been so packed with things to think about that he fully expected to lie awake for hours, mulling it all over. He wanted to continue talking to Ron, but... Mrs. Weasley was now creaking back downstairs again, and once she had gone, he distinctly heard others making their way upstairs. In fact, many legged creatures were cantering softly up and down outside the bedroom door. Oh, that's creepy. Ugh. And Hagrid, the care of magical creatures t teacher, was saying, Beauties, aren't they? Hey, Harry, we'll be, studied, we'll be studying weapons this term. And Harry saw that the creatures had cannons for heads and were wheeling to face him. He ducked. The next thing he knew, he was curled into a warm ball under his bedclothes, and George's loud voice was filling the room. Oh, Mum says get up! Your breakfast is in the kitchen, and then she needs you in the drawing room. There are loads more doxies than she thought, and she's found a nest of dead puff skins under the sofa. Okay. All right, doxies and puff skins? <laughs> Half an hour later, Harry and Ron, who had dressed and breakfasted quickly, entered the drawing room. A long, high-ceilinged room on the first floor with olive green walls, covered in dirty tapestries. I think he's starting to like Hedwig. W was Hedwig just here somewhere? Why is everybody talking about Hedwig? Oh, they hooted dolefully. I totally forgot about that. Yeah, Hedwig came back. No, I, I forgot. I, I just scooted. St you know what? I feel ashamed of myself. I feel ashamed. Good. I feel ashamed that I didn't hoot. Not because I didn't like him. <laughs> I, I, it's not like I don't like him. I like him. It's just, uh, yeah, they haven't done anything yet. Except for just hoot and bring letters. Everybody's going to hate me for saying that. Who cares? Okay. Um, okay. The carpet exhaled little clouds of dust every time someone put their foot on it, and the long, moss-green velvet curtains were buzzing as though swarming with invisible bees. It was around that these that Mrs. Weasley, Hermione, Ginny, Fred, and George were grouped, all looking rather peculiar as they had each tied a cloth over their nose and mouth. Each of them was also holding a large bottle of black liquid with a nozzle at the end. Cover your faces and take a spray! Mrs. Weasley said to Harry and Ron the moment she saw them, pointing to, pointing to two more bottles of black liquid standing on a spindle-legged table. It's doxyside. I've never seen an infestation this bad. What have those house elves been doing for the last ten years? Hermione's face was half co concealed by a tea towel, but Harry distinctly saw her throw a reproachful look at Mrs. Weasley. Creatures really are... Oh, oh uh, who is it? Hermione. Creatures really old... He probably couldn't manage. You'd be surprised what creature can manage when he wants to, Hermione, said Sirius, who had just entered the room carrying a blood-stained bag of what appeared to be dead rap rats. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been feeding Buckbeak, he added, in reply to Harry's inquiring look. I keep him upstairs in my mother's bedroom. Anyway, Miss Writing Desk. Yes, Hedwig is a girl. Sorry, I keep on forgetting that. My bad. 
He dropped the bag of rats into an armchair, then bent over to examine the locked cabinet, which, Harry noticed for the first time, was shaking slightly. Well, Molly, I'm pretty sure this is a boggart, said Sirius, peering through the keyhole. But perhaps we ought to let Mad Eye have a shift, a, sh a shifty at it. Oh, that's what he said. <laughs> I did before we let it out, knowing my mother. There could be something much worse. Right you are, Sirius, said Mrs. Weasley. They were both speaking in carefully light, polite voices that told Harry quite plainly that neither had forgotten their disagreement of the night before. A loud, clanging bell sounded from downstairs, followed at once by the cacophony of screams and wails that had triggered the previous night by Tonks knocking over the umbrella stand. I keep telling her them not to ring the doorbell, said Sirius ex exasperatedly, hurrying out of the room. They heard him thundering down the stairs as Mrs. Black's screeches echoed up through the house once more. Stains of disorder! Filthy half-breeds! Blood traitors! Children of filth! <laughs> oh, man. Close the door, please, Harry, said Mrs. Weasley. Harry took as much time as he dared to close the drawing room door. He wanted to listen to what was going on downstairs. Sirius had obviously managed to shut the curtains over his mother's portrait because she had stopped screaming. <laughs> it's really funny. It's a really funny bit. I, I bet this is a really great bit in the movie. You know, this is, this is such a... I, I could just, uh, like, you know, hearing the, the sounds far away in the hallway, covering it up, her like, ah! <laughs> Yeah, I can, I can see that being really good. Um, Harry took as much time as he dared to close the drawing room door. He wanted to listen to what was going on downstairs. Sirius had obviously managed to shut the curtains over his mother's portrait because she had stopped screaming. He heard Sirius walking down the hall, then the clattering of the chain on the front door, and then a deep voice he recognized as Kingsley Shacklebolt saying, Esty has just relieved me. Uh, oh, really deep, R really deep. Estia's just relieved me, so she's got Moody's cloak now. Thought I'd leave a report for Dumbledore. Feeling Mrs. Weasley's eyes on the back of his head, Harry, Harry, regretful, Harry regretfully closed the drawing room door and rejoined the Doxy party. Mrs. Weasley was bending over to check the page on Doxy's in Gilderoy Lockhart's Guide to Household Pets. Eats. Oh, a little reference to, to Lockhart. Which was lying open on the sofa. She, uh, Ron's mom loves him. Yeah, I know, I know. She, she loves him, as, as all do what was the, the, the moms basically all were hanging around that shop where he was signing, right? Yeah. Um, uh, where, where, where are we? Sorry. Uh, this is, okay. Right, you lot, you need to be careful because Doxy's bite and their teeth are poisonous. Got a bottle of antidote here, but I'd rather not. No, uh, nobody needed it. She straightened up, positioned herself squarely in front of the curtains, and beckoned them all forward. When I say the word, stop spraying immediately, she said. They'll, they'll come flying out at us, I expect, but it stays on the spray. But it says on the sprays, one good squirt will paralyze them. When they're immobilized, just throw them in this bucket. She stepped carefully out of their line of fire and raised her own. All right, squirt! Harry had been spraying only a few seconds when a fully grown doxy came soaring out of a fold in the material, shiny beetle-like wings whirring, tiny needle-sharp te needle teeth bared, its fairy-like body covered with thick black hair, and its four tiny fists clenched with fury. Harry caught it full in the face with a blast of doxy side. It froze in midair and fell with a surprisingly loud thunk onto the worn carpet below. Harry picked it up and threw it into the, into the bucket. Fred, what are you doing? said Mrs. Weasley sharply. Spray that at once and throw it away! Harry looked around. Fred was holding a struggling doxy between his forefinger and thumb. <laughs> Righto, Fred said brightly, spraying the doxy quickly in the face so that it had fainted. But the moment Mrs. Weasley back was turned, he pocketed it. <laughs> there it is! There it is! Congratulations, Rowling! You did it again. <laughs> Turned, he pocketed it. Pocketed it. Not bad, not bad. I'm getting it. Pocketed it. Pocketed it. Pocketed it. Um, with a wink. We want to experiment with doxy venom for our skydiving snack boxes, George told Harry under his breath. 
Deftly spraying two doxies at once as they soared straight for his nose, Harry moved closer to George and muttered out of the corner of his mouth, mouth What are skiving snack boxes? Range of sweets to make you ill, George whispered, keeping a wary eye on Mrs. Weasley's back. Not seriously ill, mind. Just ill enough to get you out of class when you feel like it. Fred and I have been developing them this summer. They're double-ended, color-coded chews. If you eat the orange half of the puking pastels, you throw up. The moment you've been rushed out of the lesson for the hospital wing, you swallow the purple half, which restores you to full fitness, enabling you to pursue the liege activity of your own choice during an hour that would otherwise have been devoted to unprof unprofitable boredom. <laughs> That's what we're putting in the advertisements anyway, whispered Fred. Who had edged out, edged over out, out of Mrs. Weasley's line of vision, and was now sweeping a few stray doxies from the floor and adding them to his pocket. But they still need a bit of work. At the moment, our testers ha are having a bit of trouble stopping themselves puking long enough to swallow the turf the purple end. <laughs> testers, us," said Fred. <laughs> "We take it in turns." George did the fainting fancies. We both tried the nose nosebleed no nougat nosebleed nougat. Mum thought we... Huh? Nougat. 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 Mum thought we'd been dueling, said George. Joke, st joke shop's still on then, Harry muttered, pretending to be adjusting the nozzle on his spray. Well, we haven't had a chance to get premises yet, said Fred, dropping his voice even lower as Mrs. Weasley mopped her brow with her scarf before, before returning to the attack. So we're running a we're running as a mail order, <laughs> mail order service at the moment. We put advertisements in the Daily Prophet last week. All thanks to you, mate, said George. But don't worry, Mum hasn't got a clue. She won't read the Daily Prophet anymore because of it telling lies about you and Dumbledore. Harry grinned. He had forced the Weasley twins to take the Thousand Galleons prize money he had won in the Triwizard Tournament to help them realize their ambition to open a joke shop. But he was still glad to know that his part in furthering their plans was unknown to Mrs. Weasley. She did not think running a joke shop was a suitable career for two of her sons. Okay, I'm going to end there. That's where I'm going to end today. Did one and a half hours. Okay, so a lot of, uh, you know, uh, th this was a little bit of a, a catch, cut, catch up episode. Here's what's been happening in your absence, Harry. Sure, yeah. 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 Here's what's been happening. He, he, catching up on the, wor on the world in that, those six weeks since uh, Voldemort has been released. So it's, it's been a good, good uh, catch up. And, uh, you know, really nice bit with Mrs. Weasley and with Sirius. They both, of course, deeply care about Harry, but uh, one or the other will have to give up their um, their parenthood, I guess, to the other at some point, I'm guessing. Uh, you have Stephen Fry to thank for that being very every book so far. Yeah, I know. I've, I heard that story. Yeah, it's crazy. It's really funny. I always say it in my head so that I never notice how hard it is to say. Yeah, it's hard to say it out loud. Out loud. Hey, buddy. Out loud. Out loud. Any questions? Any thoughts? And there might be a delay, so I don't know if I'll actually... Get them. One maybe to set to live and the other on top. That that that's weird. The order of comms is different on my t TV and phone. Oh, is it doing that too? Oh, wait a second. Let's see. Um, let's see if it's out of order here. One maybe a set to live and the other to top. No, I, I'm still seeing the same thing on both. I don't know. Really helping me get through this ongoing quarantine thing. Thank you, John, Mark, and Dexter. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome, Natasha. I'm I, I'm glad it is. I hope you're doing okay. Uh, and I, I've just been forgetting to say, but I still mean it to everybody. You know, you have meaning, you are loved, you have purpose. So, you know, it's in some countries, the quarantine is very different. I don't know where people are tuning in from. We're in BC and Canada. We're in phase two. There's, a, there's actually a lot of things we can do. Um, so we'll see. We'll see where it develops from here. But yeah, it's it's, it's tough. Okay, friends. Thank you. Uh, don't forget to press that little bell button so you know, so you can find the, the, the lives easier. I, I, I've read that helps. Don't know if it does. I'll be back on Thursday, not tomorrow. Not tomorrow, okay? There are two different modes to the comments, live chat and top chat. So if people have selected different ones, they might be seeing different orders. Oh, thanks, Lois. Thank you very much. Uh, Navneet, thank you very much. Okay, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. I will see you, to, uh, not tomorrow, I'll see you on Thursday at 6 o'clock. Uh, for some more Harry Potter and Kong's Corner. Babana. <laughs>